It's one of our uh, demonstration layouts we take to exhibitions. And we said we'd be looking under the hood. What actually makes it work underneath? What electronics, mechanics, and so on do we employ to get the effects that we have? Some of you will have seen it at exhibitions, don't know what happens uh, under the bonnet. Others wouldn't have seen it. So let's have a, an exploration. That's our typical stand at a show. We already discussed, you'll remember this layout here, the up and down layout in some detail at a previous meeting. We're now looking at this one here, which is the back and forth layout. It's only 38 inches, this shot of a, a meter long, it's only 24 inches deep. But as you'll see, we've packed loads of stuff into it. That's what it looks like now, and we'll, we'll work our way through. You probably guessed it back and forth. It's called so because we've got a barge here that goes back and forth. We've got a tram that goes back and forth. We've got a local that goes back and forth, and we've got a road roller that goes back and forth. Hence the, the, the title of that particular layout. There's been some discussion in the forum about uh, animation and automation, and I thought this was a good description of what we mean by animation. And it includes all the things we do, people that move, lights that come on and off, sound effects. So that's a description of animation that I would go along with and what we actually practice. And there's another discussion separately about automation and gave that definition an operation that involves no human activity. Or as I put it, things what happen in your layout without you doing anything. So we're looking at animation or automation. Automation could apply just to the, the uh, train movements, or it could apply to animations, the automate animations, which is what we're doing largely in this layout. I thought it's worth looking at its origins. This was the original version of back and forth. It started life as only one local that ran up and down a single track with a, a wide point at one end. And the signals moved, the gates moved and so on. There's animations at the shed. And you could either press the big red knob, big red button, and it would do it all automatically, or the kids could throw switches to make things work. And that was a starting point. I think we had that for a number of years to shows. And then we thought we ought to extend it to do more and more. So we got to this point. This is us building on it. We've now extended the, its depth. We've added in, as you can see, uh, a piece of double O line for the uh, tram. And we started to build up the canal at the back. We still have the, the switches at this stage. And then that's it, mostly built except for the switches and the big red knob, which we thought we should remove and put in some other activity. And that's the final piece that we have today with all the features added and active. So let's have a look. What I thought I would do was work my way through it from the back the canal, then the tram, then the local, then the roller, and see how we did each of those activities. Everything you see there that's circled, all these yellow circles are showing things that move. Sometimes it's the, the, the tram or the local, but most times it's actual animations, the crane going round, doors opening, all that kind of thing. So there's actually 20 things on that small layout that actually move automatically. On top of that, we have other things. All the ones that are circled in the light blue are lights that come off and on. 
automatically. And we have uh, 23 of them. So if you've got 20 uh, things in motion and 23 where lights actually come off and on, all in that small space. And to give us the animation, we have a number of sensors, not many, just five sensors there, as you'll see. And we'll discuss these as we go along. So we've got six square feet of layout, and we've got all of that going on in it. So it's jam-packed. It's no wonder that so many kids and adults like what they see when they come to the show. It attracts lots uh, of attention. Right, that's the background. Let's look at what we do, starting with the canal. Canal is quite an unusual feature. You don't often see uh, a canal, certainly an animated canal, in a, a layout. But we thought that would be a, an interesting extra. So we've got a barge. And you can just see there that we have lights permanently illuminated in the barge. We'll explain that a bit later. It moves smoothly and slowly and from left to right and back again and then stops in the middle and there's activities along the way. How do we get the movement? Well, we use a lead screw which is basically a threaded rod on which we have some kind of nut. And when you spin the rod, the, 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 the nut runs up and down the lead screw. The one you see behind me is advertised for 3D printers. And you can buy it that way, and you simply attach a, a motor down this end here into the shaft, and you secure both bearings up and down there, and this piece will traverse up and down. In our case, we wanted something longer than that, so we fabricated a own from a longer uh, threaded rod. That's the principle of it. We've got a, a stepper motor here, which drives the shaft, and we have here, there's the nut, we have a nano that controls the activities here and a driver to drive the stepper motor. Let's just, you yeah, haven't seen it in action before. What's happening, you'll see uh, on the right hand side there near my hand, there's a micro switch. And when they start, the nut will hunt till it gets to the end and hit the micro switch. And now it knows its reference point for all future excursions. So once we know we've hit ground zero, the any button press then will be so many movements from that point. So we can stop there, we can stop further on, we can stop further back and, and come back again. And we have that working fairly fast just to show you. But of course, being a stepper motor, we can make it as fast or as slow as we actually need. And that's the principle of what we have on the layout, although we're not using a stepper motor because the DC motor will work. In that case, we don't need the accuracy of the stopping point you would get with a stepper motor. And then we can see it installed. You can just see there the motor, the DC motor. There's the rod. There's the bearing. And there's the piece that moves back and forward. And along the way, it's going to contact various micro switches. There's one there, there's one in the middle, and one at the end, so it knows where it is. What we'd originally uh, planned to do was, on top of that nut that moves, we were going to glue on a magnet, and then have a magnet in the barge, and it would pull it along. But we abandoned that idea because we discovered that there was too much friction. The bars would jerk, jerk, jerk rather than go smoothly. Although, although the nut was running smoothly, it, the magnets couldn't follow. We tried different materials uh, as a base, but gave it up. And you can, what we do now is we have a hook on here, 
of which the barge sits as a lug. And up the top right, you'll see the control slot as a pick and a driver for the motor, 293D chip. I call this piece the sled. Uh, it's chamfered so that it's able to hit the micro switches, which are roller micro switches, so you can go from either side, come from either direction, and it won't snag. And for the bed of the canal, as you can see there, we used a plan, uh, plastic conduit. Just taking off the top part and using this U-shaped piece as the bed for the lead screw. So you can just see there now, there's, we've screwed down the plastic conduit. There's the controls. The pick does, does more than just control the badge, as you'll see in a minute. So we said that we do different things along the way. Let us just have a look at this one. It's about to hit the nitro switch. The light comes on in the building. The lights come on in, in the van. And it'll reverse out. And then the foreground, you may have just cut the flashing from the, the tram. There we go. When the bars leaves, it clears the micro switch. And the goal goes into reverse. This is a new piece that we've only added in the last few weeks, the van coming out and the lights and so on. But how do we move the van on, on a, a path? And we, we used the, this particular uh, servo mount, which is a rack and pinion, which translates the rotational piece into a linear movement. And the moving piece has got a little hole in it for putting a bit of piano wire in. But we thought we wouldn't use that because that would be fine when you're pulling, if you're pulling the van out, the correct, but when you're pushing it back, it could easily swivel to one side or the other and jam. We want to go straight back. So the answer was I got a piece of brass, heated it up with a solder and iron, and then plunged it into the plastic while it was still hot. And then when it hardens, that piece of uh, brass will not move. So we've now got a, a piece that's in a slot and can move it happily back and forth without jamming. You can see that working. Right, I've uh, put a pin in here and I've heated up the brass and pushed it into the plastic. And that's the result. Not as much movement as I would have hoped, even at 180 degrees. So we've now got the servo operating a uh, brass upright that's going to come through the baseboard and pull the van. I had to put a, a brass piece on top here with a slot because that was where the, I had to grind out the, the rivet that held the, the van together. So it left a hole. So I filled the hole with a brass plate with a slot and that can match up with this piece here. And then again, go under the baseboard, cut a slot there for mounting the, the servo. And then we can see it now. We've engaged the brass upright in with the slot. And additionally, I wired in some micro lips LEDs in the back of the van for the van lights. And then just used a glue gun to stop it drop, dropping off the end when it's, when it's being transported. And that's it. This is a easy points kit modified to do the, the van.
easy points, as you know, is you've got one input and it'll go one direction or the other, whereas we wanted to do different things here. So effectively, I didn't need those three trimmers, which you get in, on the easy points kits, because at a fixed speed, we don't want to change the speed and we don't need to set the two end points. We wanted to run at 180 to get the maximum movement. So effectively, it's two thirds of that board that was used. And there's the code for it, or, or the pseudo code, They're very simple. Either the barge has, has reached the middle and it's hit that middle micro switch or it's not. If it's hit the micro switch, don't do everything at once. Wait a little while so that the barge comes in, stops. A few seconds later, the light above the building comes on. A few seconds later, the van lights come on. And a few seconds later, the van comes out. So it's a kind of process. We could have used a sequencer, I suppose, but since we had to program the, the uh, pick anyway, I just made it do that. And of course, once the, the uh, barge leaves, we do the thing in reverse. The van goes back into the building, the building lights go out and so on. So it's fairly simple to, to code, but I think you'll agree it's a, an interesting add-on to the existing layout. And then when the bars gets to the other end, it will hit the other micro switch. Things on the light in the building. The man comes out to see what's going on. And then you load the load into the bar. How do we do that? Well, the two servos, there's one servo which you see here that moves the man back and forward. And an easy points kit to do it. And the second easy points kit operating another servo. With a long arm that drops and lifts the load. And you can just hopefully see a piece of fishing line coming here, which goes up and out the building. And there's the pick that you saw earlier on with the 293D. So the pick is controlling the, the motor to make it go forward, reverse, and stop at the three places under the control of these three inputs, that's your three micro switches. So it knows where the barge has reached at any one point and will do the appropriate things. So sometimes it's going to bring on the light or the winch for the barge or the man coming out and so on. Sometimes it's operating the motor. Just using a 14 pin pick. There's the barge. It's just built from a, a kit modified because the, the kit as it came had a barge which is about half as long again, which would take up too much space in the layout. So we shortened it deliberately. And we've got two LEDs in there. And we don't have a battery in it. What we do have, they can maybe just see a, a, a black circle there which is meant to be part of the load of the barge. In actual fact, it's a super cap, which we can charge up. And that lights the LEDs all day at the layout. And you can just see the lug here that you saw that will engage with the moving part on the shaft. We've got a little charger. And on the back of the barge, we've got, we've got three pins. If you shot it with a jumper, then that means that you're putting the lights on. If you unplug that, you can plug in this piece here, which goes to a charger. And we can see that it, when you plug this into there, it'll tell you the existing voltage on the super cap. If you plug it into the mains, it will then tell you the charge is coming up. It doesn't take long to recharge. So we've now got something in the barge itself. We've got something in the, in the middle of the layout and we've got something on the left. And that left that 
empty space, a bit barren looking on the right hand side. And we thought, what are we going to do with that? And the answer came from uh, John McMorn. John built a 3D printed scissors lift. I think I can show you this working. So normally the building light is working quite happily. We filled that blank space with a debris and, and bins, put up a fence here to give a bit more life to that corner. But eventually we have a problem with the light. Eventually the circuit has gone open circuit. And at that point, the man's got to come up and do the repair. He goes up to the box to fix it. And when he's fixed it, the light comes on and he can pop back down again. Job done. We didn't want to make that be triggered by the, the barge hitting the, the micro switches. You wouldn't have a, a failing light every time the bars passed. So it's got its own circuit, its own pick to control it. There's the scissors lift. It's actually an, an end gauge version. The double O was too big for what we needed, but you'll see it in operation. It's quite simple, but quite ingenious. He didn't get it from a download, he actually designed it himself. There's some experiments. Quite smooth. What we did was write its own bit of code. We didn't want it to happen all the time because that would mean that the server would be working constantly. So we make it happen every three minutes, plus the time it takes to do the actual animation. So after a three minute break, the light starts to flicker and goes out, and there's a little delay, and then up goes the lift, the repair takes place, and then it comes back down again, and again you wait another three minutes. So we've now got covered the canal and all its animations and activities and lights and so on. And that's what's involved. Eight different kits involved. One for the speed controller to control the speed of the barge. Two random lights kits for the buildings coming off and on. We've actually got a welder in one of the buildings, you'll see it flashing. And four easy points for all the animations. It needs three picks, one to operate the barge, one to operate the van, and one to operate the lift. Uh, somebody said to me, well, probably all the things you're doing this way could be run with one giant you know, mega, I mean, no mega or whatever. But we wanted to avoid that for a couple of reasons. One is, if the mega goes, everything goes. We've lost a lot. Plus, we wanted to have as many things independent. We don't want the random lights to run with the mega. We want to showcase the random lights kit. The same with the speed controller, the same with the welder and so on. So we deliberately used uh, individual kits to, to achieve what we wanted. So that's one of the big features on, on the layout. A more simple one is the tram. Again, I think I can show you in action. I've got the, the pocket money kit for the welder used in the random flasher mode so that it, it represents arcing at the pickup. To achieve that, we used just one speed control again for the tram. The shuttle kit is all we're using there. And inside the tram, we've got the welder 
pocket money kit to do the random flashing. That's the second one that goes back and forth. Then there's a local itself. This may be a model railway layout after all. So let's have a look at it. Once all the animations on the right are finished, the local will start coming out. But first we have to change the signals and move the barrier gates. There goes the gates. Close to road traffic. Then we'll see the semaphore round coming up. It comes round and round comes the water crane. The gates close, signals going down, and it will stay there for a bit before doing the circuit back towards the sheds. You'll notice we've got a, a Y point here. So every time this local goes out, I'll come back to the the other platform. So it'll be the rear platform next time, come back out and come back into the front, and then to the rear and then to the front, all automatically operating the points. So we have here the local speed again, some more easy points to operate the point, the signal and the gates. We've got the signals, you probably saw it. Uh, we've got an option for easy points for semaphore rams. We get the jerk going up and the bounce going down. So we use that in one of the easy points. And then we have to know, have you arrived at the left-hand side? Have you arrived at the right-hand side? And what we've done, we've used, if I can go back to the picture, this piece here is in fact, a hectare. And at the platform side, we've got a laser totty. One laser totty because with the Y, and all we want to know is has the local come in on any of those? So we don't need two detectors. We've got one that just goes across the two. And if you break the beam, any of those two, it knows you've, you've arrived safely and it can start the rest of the process. Raises the question, how do we make the, the local actually move? Have we covered that yet? We'll come to that very shortly. Before we get to that, what happens when the local gets to the other end from the station? First, the light comes on above the door, and then the man comes out, then the sliding door slides open, then the crane comes round, and then the lorry comes round from the back here. And after a period of time, these all restore themselves. Right, to make that work, not using easy points here, we're using a, a servo four board, so it can handle four servos, one for the crane, one for the door, one for the man that comes out, and one for the lorry that comes round. There's also a twinkler kit in there, you may have seen a brazier in the yard. So that, can you link that with the local going back and forward, we've now got animations at, at both ends. The crane is dead easy. We just poked it through the baseboard straight onto the servo. Nothing, is, nothing fancier than that to make that work. There's, there it's there. The crane just sits on top of that servo. And use a heavy duty servo here because they, we've got a, a cast, a cast um, lorry, which is quite heavy. And it's coming out with quite a radius. So it's quite a bit of weight on the usual plastic horn. So it's been replaced with a, a brass um, tube. They take the extra weight and it's an extra large servo there. And the little blue servo you see there, that is the one that's going to slide the sliding door open and closed. There's another servo in the building that makes a man come out. You can just see at the top, the servo floorboard. 
And now we get to the traction and all the other things, all controlled by a nano. There's the power to the track up the top. There's, that's going to a port to set the speed. That's your main power. This is your 12 volts as usual. It's power the nano. Then a whole bunch of outputs to operate the points, the gates, and so on. So they feed directly to the, the easy points of the server four. And the yard light, the station light, and then the, the sidings and the platform, that's the two totties coming in from the laser detector and the hector. And up the top, we've got the 293D. Slightly different in this particular case, we're using pulse width modulation. The, uh, the barge and the tram just had straightforward DC to take it back and forward. We used pulse width modulation there for efficiency, but also we wanted to have some acceleration and deceleration. We tried the, the ATC kit that makes cell, but it took far, far too long for the acceleration to kick in. It also allowed us to overcome stitching because what we're doing, we're changing the pulse width from a, a, a narrow pulse width to a wider, to a wider, so it'd go faster. But at the very beginning, we gave it some hefty wide pulses, just very, very short periods of time, just to give it a kick to overcome any stitching. And it's not noticeable. And we get the benefit of acceleration and the other end deceleration when it hits the detectors. We also have a, a cable here uh, that we can connect to reprogram it if necessary. And that's all there is. On the right hand side, three inputs, one to set the speed and two to detect where the local is at any one time. And the rest are all outputs to either control the motor or to control servos or lighting. And it's all done from just that one nano. So we've got inputs from the detectors. It's got to operate the point, the signals, all the shed animations, all the lights, and the traction and the acceleration. What we did, we've got a station lamp that comes on on one of the platforms separate from the other lights. And we've got a yard lamp on the other side. And they only come on when the, the local is, a, is meant to be moving. So if the lo local is meant to be moving to this side, this light comes on. And the local is meant to be moving in that direction, this light comes on. We did that so that we know if it does at any time uh, stick because a duck and so on, we know what it's direction it's meant to go, give it a flick with a finger left or right. So that's the, the local. The station itself doesn't have too much to it. You saw earlier the yard crane that comes round automatically detected. And at the back here we have two things. Under that local we've got the steam emulator kit. So every so often you'll hear the steam release. Right? And the, the coach behind it, that's double O by the way, it's meant to be a dual gauge, double O uh, leak come out, the, out of here and the narrow gauge come in here. So that double O coach has got in it the kit for the automatic coach lighting. So at any point we can lean over the layout, put our finger on top of it and move it and show that movement brings, brings on the lights in the coach. So we can show another, demonstrate another kit. So all we have there are three easy points to operate the crane, the coach lighting inside the, the coach and the steam under the local. And lastly, we've got the, the very front of the layout, the road works and other uh, activities. And here we see the case activity building a road roller. It's the same principle as the, the lead screw, except it's much shorter. Same idea, 
except it's not got three different detectors. It's only got a micro switch at each end. So it can go back, stop, come back, stop, come back, stop, and so on. And we've got a slot there for the, the nut, and it comes through and catches on permanently onto the road roller. You don't see that part because we've got a hedge here. So from the viewer's point of view, you don't see this mechanism. The, the hook that's pulling it back and forward, hidden behind the hedge. We've got enough friction that it makes the wheels rotate, as you can see there. There's enough weight in that roll roller to make the rubber tires rotate. A small one also we have is the hut. It's got the old fashioned big H aerial, which also from time to time rotates. The, this lorry also tips every so often on a timer. So we've got a twin flasher for the beacons in front of the lorry with the roadworks are, and also to operate the, uh, the crossing lights, two timers, a pick, two servos, two easy points. We're racking up quite an amount of electronics here, as you've probably noticed already. And lastly, night time at back and forth. One of the things I wanted to have was different lighting effects and one sound effect only in this case. We go to shows and sometimes those shows are very badly lit and everything looks too much in the dark. So that's why we put a hood over it. I think you'll agree that that image at night time is much, much nicer than even the, the daytime image. We achieved that by having a separate hood that clips over it. And uh, Neil did the hood. And under the hood here, we have three different lead strips of different colours. So we can have daylight and sort of dusk and then bad weather. And under here, we've also got a loudspeaker and a pick to control the lights and to play a DF player to make the sound of thunder. At the back of the, the hood and the back of the layout, we've got bin plugs with a, a linking cable so that when the top part up here decides it's time to go to night time, it lets the layout know and then on comes the various lights in the, the station, the, the lights along the back of the wall here, the lights in, in the cars, all that kind of stuff, all the extra lights come on for night time. And then every so often we're going to have bad weather and thunder and lightning. Let's have a look. It's just turning tonight. You'll see the car lights come on. Station lights come on. The wall lights have just come on. And soon we'll have lightning followed by thunder. And as always, after bad weather, we make the sun come out, at least an early layout we do. There's what we've got under the hood. We've got a pick to control it, three LED strips, one very bright white LED, the one they make flash for lightning, a DF player for the, the thunder. 
and then a, a sequence that goes on. The link, this pick tells the baseboard, go to the night sequence, which brings on all the various lights. And then it'll flash the, the lightning, play the thunder, and then they're back to nice weather again. We've got a special pick just to do that. The trigger comes in from the, the hood, and it then brings on and turn the various lights that are inside the buildings and the vehicles. And then when the trigger goes off again, we'll gradually extinguish those lights again. So finally, gents, to make this whole thing work, we've got 32 different mer kits under that hood. 14 different types of mer kits. We've got five picks. We've got one Arduino. We've got two DC motors. 15 servos, DF player, cuddly toy, holiday for two in Miami, and so on. We've packed a lot in, we call it a quart and a pint pot. So that's how it works. I hope you've enjoyed it. Are there any questions, comments, or suggestions for future changes? <laughs>